You shouldn't believe everything that you hear, but you shouldn't also not believe everything that you hear in your own mind. You know, like question what comes from outside, but question what comes from inside as well, because a lot of it is outdated. And um, I just recorded a video today um, and, and, and I'm going to speak on this uh, later on. But because, you know, there is a quote that, you know, I'm sure you've heard before when they say, you know, like you learn from your mistakes. Right. That's what people say that all the time. And, you know, I, I used to, you know, hear that and think, oh, yeah, yeah, well, right, right. It makes sense to learn from your mistakes. Otherwise, you do the same mistakes over and over again or you get the same lessons until you learn. Right. But the question is, like, do we always learn from mistakes? And what do we learn from mistakes? It's actually a super interesting question, you know, because I believe that we always take something away, even if we're not aware of it. And that's where the danger can come in, because if you don't really sit down and question yourself. Like, let's say you tried something and you failed or uh, something was painful, end of a relationship. Maybe you set up for a goal and you failed or you know you gave up, whatever the case may be. And now you have a story about why it failed. Everyone has a story, but sometimes they're not even aware that they have a story. That's the most dangerous one because you're not even sure if you learned the right lesson. So if now you have the wrong judgment, that's where beliefs are created. And if you, now you repeat it in the future, now you condition yourself to believe a certain way, and that becomes a big limitation. And you know, when you think about, oh, we learn from our mistakes, the question is also, okay, but what about when we're successful? Right? Because um, it's exactly the same concept. Sometimes you might be successful at something. So you take away, oh, you know what? I was successful because of this and this and this. But is it true? Is that the real reason why you're successful? Or is that maybe also just a belief? How many people grind? They do 20 different things. Like, let's say you're, you know, you're, you, you feel sick and you're not sure what it is. So you know what? You're going to take medication for 10 different things. And then the pain goes away. Now, was it one of these things that you took that helped you? Was it all of them? Was it a combination? You don't really know. That's what a lot of people do in business, in relationships. In, you know, I had a friend of mine who, <laughs> it was funny. He was in Dubai, actually. He was a neighbor. And uh, he was constantly trying to lose weight. And then uh, I saw him. And I was like, man, you lost a lot of weight in a short period of time. And he's like, yeah, man. And I'm like, how did you do it? And he tells me, man, I've just been eating a tan of a, a can of tuna and an apple every day. That's all. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, that's not very sustainable and not very healthy. But in his mind, it works. He's successful. So now what is the lesson he's going to take away from that? So, you know, sometimes they say if it's not broke, don't fix it. Well, I don't know. I, I like to reevaluate everything. Even the things that I'm good at, that I'm successful at, because it's a judgment. Just because something works doesn't mean it can't work better, faster, make more fun, whatever. And sometimes, you know, like we get stuck in certain concepts of how life should be. We get stuck in concepts of who we are, how life is, how other people are. And we don't challenge it. And if we don't challenge it, life will eventually push us and we'll be forced to face these things. Or... It's going to take a long time before we can transform. And um, I wanted to talk today about like the main topic that I'm passionate about because I was really like focusing on so many different topics. And I'm, like I said, a student of life. So I, I constantly question and I learned most of these things for myself. You know, I'm like, I always say that, uh, like, I really found my calling. I really believe that this is a gift that I've been given to be able to serve people and to be able to go into this direction to understand the human mind and human nature. But I always got to say, like, I profit in so many ways because before I was a coach, I was studying all these things in my free time. I, I was like a filmmaker. I studied filmmaking. I had my production company. And on the weekends, and I would go to where, to, 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 to workshops and, and events and, you know, listen to Tony Robbins audiobooks and, you know, like do all these things in the free time that I had. Now I have so much more time because that's what I do. And um, I launched a podcast. I think, JP, we met. Yeah, like maybe it's already seven years. 
you know how time flies, right? Like, you're just like, now you're already the next year. Because exactly at that time when we met, I launched a podcast. That's where actually, like, the when I met JP, I was just starting, you know, like, at, become a speaker and a coach. But I've been studying these tools for the past 15, 16 years for myself. And then I started teaching other people. And I had a podcast. It's called, in German, Mach es einfach, which is called Just Do It. And... um. So it's kind of a slogan, mach es einfach or mach es einfach, because it's a wordplay. It says, just do it or simply do it, but do it simply. And so the whole focus was on doing, because that's what most people want. They want to achieve their goals. It's like, I want to, you know, like be more productive. I'm, I'm procrastinating. I have like fears that are blocking me. But ultimately, I just want to be able to do what I want to do to get what I want to get. But most of the blocks are in your identity, are in who you are, what your beliefs are, how you look at yourself, how you look at the world, what your emotions are and what, you be, what your thoughts are that then stand in your way to take action. So I recently, well, recently, actually, yeah, a few months, like six months ago, I released a new podcast. So I, I was doing the whole just do it, but I switched it to just be it. Because that's the actual doing. Instead of having a to-do list, you have a to-be list. The reason why you're not able to do is because you're not in the essence of being. And I prepared a little presentation just so we can go through it together. And uh, let's have a look at it. So that's what I call it, identity creation. <laughs> and um, I'm just going to go through like mm, a concept. Or actually, because... The coaching that I do is in is in German. Or it's funny because in German, ich means me. And if you take I-C-H of me, it stands for Identity Creation Handbook. And that's basically a handbook that I give the people so they actually understand who they are. To study yourself is the most important topic you can study in this life. You can read all the books in the world, but the most important book you need to read is the book about yourself. But how can you read that book if you never write it? And how can you write that book if you don't know anything about yourself? That's why you have to study yourself dualistically. To question yourself. To understand the hidden aspects of you. And the progression as well. Because I don't really believe that we have only one identity. I believe that it's a symphony of identities. We all know that. With certain people, you have a different version of you that comes out. In certain situations, you have a different version of you that comes out. You have the comical, the clown, you have the serious person, you have the child, you have the lover, you have the warrior, you have the, you know, so many different. And then you can be a parent, your son, your friend, your, you know, so your wife, your husband. So you have so many different roles. And in these roles, you have different identities and you have different versions of yourself in time. You have your inner child, but even then you have your inner adolescent. You have like the version of you you were five years ago. You might not be that version now, but aspects of that version are still there. And there are certain situations where it comes out and you're surprised even sometimes. You're like, oh, my God, where did that come from? I didn't know I still had that part of me in me, but some people can trigger that part of you. And usually we focus on these people. This person said that. That's why I reacted like this. Uh. No one can trigger anything out of you that's not already there. But if you don't understand it, if you don't know it, number one, you can't be manipulated. And number two, you don't even understand when you're manipulating yourself. That's why I believe that this is one of the most important topics to study is yourself. And um, there's a lot of questions, a lot of introspection. Um, and um, I wanted to go through this. I call it the identity transformer. And... Um, there are like four areas, four key areas that I look at when uh, when I go through the identity transformer. And I first look at, you know, what, what, what most people are focusing on when they want to reach a goal, when they want to create a new habit, when you want to learn a new skill, whatever it is. You go from knowing to doing. That's the main path, right? I, I write a book or I go to a coaching session. I need just to I just need to know what to do and then do it. And I do it long enough. And then this is a new habit or I get the result and that's it. But there are hidden aspects. 
that most people don't pay attention to. If you really want to transform your identity and ultimately your reality, and I will come to why you want to transform your identity consciously, because we always transform our, uh, our identity. So we have environment. Environment is extremely important. You are a product of your environment. So your identity was shaped in an environment. An environment, um, I'm not going to go too deep into environment today because I want to focus on another aspect. But under environment, I see not only places and people, because that's what usually people think about. Our environment is maybe the country you live in or, you know, like uh, the people that you hang around with. But it's also your structures and your routines. Time is an environment. Your body is an environment. You could even say that the energy that surrounds you, the movies you watch and everything is an environment because you can have a physical environment that affects you, but you can have uh, media that you consume or movies that you consume that have an impact on who you become. So it's all an extension of our environment. And if we really want to create and shape our future self, we cannot just let the environment be uh, automatic. Like they say, you are a product of your environment, but your environment is a product of you if you design it. Otherwise, you leave it up to chance and then you fight against your environment. And everyone knows how it is when you fight against an environment that doesn't support your goal. A lot of people are in an environment that actually reflects the version they were and not the version they want to be in the future. So they held back. And obviously, there are many blocks that we have and and, and pain and it's also a, a comfort zone, which is the same with all our habits and all that stuff. But it's important to be aware of it. Now, the fourth aspect is identity. That's an area where a lot of people don't even look at. They they they. They don't even think about identity or have a concept of identity. And that's why I really want to go into it, like what I understand by identity and how we can actually practically, practically use it. Because I believe that our identity changes all the time, especially if you change your environment. Like, let's say you move to another country. Let's say I was thinking about that. I was talking to JP because I wanted to like now, like almost like a kind of a digital nomad, you can you can say. But um, I grew up in the Ivory Coast. I came to Germany when I was 14, did my school over there, studied in Holland for four years. I was living in Dubai for 10 years. Now I'm living in Thailand. All of this has shaped me. I would have been completely different if I stayed in one country my whole life. So if you now have a job or you become an entrepreneur, it will change you. If you were single and you're married or you have children, now you're a father or a mother, it will change you. You have certain aspects of your personality that will change by default just because your environment and the circumstances in your environment change. Certain events in your life have shaped you, but now we can actually design it. That's the most important thing because first you can understand how your identity was created till now. And these same elements you can use to recreate an identity. And now we'll speak about why it's so important to focus on identity because when you look at the chain of events, if you have a goal, right, that's the ultimate thing you want. And it's important to also link that because you will have to activate different aspects in your identity and in yourself to reach a specific goal that you won't necessarily need for another goal. So that's why it's important to know what do you really want? A lot of people don't even know that. Well, that's something that you need to start with. But what is the goal you want to achieve? Okay. And it can be a big goal or like a vision or it can be a small goal. You say, okay, you know what? Or a measurable goal that you fix and you say, okay, you want, I want to achieve this. It can be uh, something that you want to have. It can also be something that you want to be. I want to be more confident. It's a goal. I want to be better at sales. I want to learn to speak Chinese fluently so I can travel around the world, whatever. So you have a goal. And then you need to know how to reach that goal. So you need the information. That is important. But once you have that and you know what to do and you don't do what you know, there's always going to be an emotion that's going to stop from taking action. So if you say you have a goal, you want to take action, and you don't take that action, it's going to be an emotion or emotions that are going to stop you from that. Or if there is something that you're doing that you want to stop to do, that's also an emotion 
that's going to force you or hold you in that behavior that you don't want. And that's why it's very important to understand that. So let's go back here. Understanding emotions is especially is, is, is very important. Because we use words all the time. It's like, okay, yeah, emotion, I have this emotion, I felt like this, I felt like that. But do you really know what you feel? That's something that you can train to become more aware and more in tune to. There is a tool that's called the emotions wheel. I don't know if you know that, but if you Google that, you can look at it. It's the emotion wheel. And um, they use that, you know, when you work with children or also in a clinical setting, um, you you actually use this tool. I can actually see if I can if I can uh, show it here. Let me just see because I always have a I always have an emotion wheel somewhere here on my in my folder. Let me just check it out. Where is it? Yeah, here. Let me just see. Okay. Boom. So this right here. <laughs> Where's my Zoom page? Okay, so this one here is the is the emotion reel, right? And that's actually like a, a good guide when you look at it on a regular basis and you really start to identify what are like certain emotions that I feel on a regular basis? What are the emotions that I felt today, this week? It doesn't even need to be always when it's very extreme just to get a sense of it. So it's like a training that you go through. And instead of just having... I mean, I, I don't know if you can really read it from here because it's kind of small. But instead of just saying, oh, I feel sad or I feel bad or I feel good, you have nuances. So you can actually really break down what was the real emotion that I was feeling. I felt rejected. I felt isolated. I felt so the deeper you go in, I don't know if you can really read it, but let's just see. I don't know. You can't really see my mouse, right? But if you go here, you say, for example, I'm angry. Now, if you go into the area of angry, the red one, let's take the first one, for example, you say, okay, I'm angry, but I felt let down and I felt betrayed. Or I'm resentful. Now you've identified the emotion and you narrowed it more down, right? And if you take time to just look at these emotions and just go through them, because sometimes you feel that, no, you know what? I feel something, but I'm not really sure. I just don't feel good. And now you can narrow it down. You're like, hold on. Actually, that's what I'm feeling. Then you can start to analyze that emotion and say, okay, why do I feel that way? How am I thinking? How am I judging? And that's where you get an understanding of emotions. We do a lot of training in my coaching where we actually consciously create emotions to understand what you're doing inside. One example is, for example, and it's actually good to use duality with that. These are exercises also that like actors do, for example, to put yourself in a specific energy. And um, let's say you take you take um, one emotion or one situation where you were really upset or ashamed or you felt guilt. Just take something negative, like a negative that you would call a negative emotion, an unpleasant emotion. And remember the situation, remember how you felt, go back and try to hold it. And you can put a timer for like two minutes. And then you try to hold that emotion just as an exercise. And then you take another emotion that is a pleasant emotion. Maybe you spent some time with friends and it was a really good time and you felt happy or you felt proud or whatever it is. And you, But take a specific situation and you set this timer. And you can do this exercise for 10 minutes. You can do it for 20 minutes, man. You can use it as a form of meditation. So now you're holding that one scene where you felt ashamed, for example, or angry. And you go in there. And two minutes is a long time when you really, you know, like go in. And you observe yourself. Like, what do you have to do? You remember, oh, the person said this and it felt like this. And what everything that was triggered that came back up and you start to feel it. You can feel your heart beating. You can feel sweat maybe, you know, just like your hormones get activated because you're replaying that scene in your mind. You're feeling everything that you felt. And then as soon as two minutes hit, try to let it go and switch to the other one. And now you go back to the moment you felt really proud or really happy or maybe, you know, the moment that your child was born or, you know, you just like go in there and it's like, 
everything else disappears. You can actually train that. In the beginning, it might be difficult because you're trying to let go of the, old, the old one and you still, oh, I'm still upset about this thing here, but I actually forgot about it for the past, you know, like six months. But now that I thought about it, it's real. You just bring it back. You bring back demons or angels. But you train and you go back to this one and then you let that go and then you go back to the first one. And then you let that go and you go back to the second one. You let go, you go back to the first one and you go back and forth. And after three, four times of doing that, something will happen inside of you because it's redundant. That's something that happens constantly, but we don't do it consciously. So it just happens automatically. But now you're actually observing what's happening. And when you do it two, three times, it's almost like a part of you can separate and observe what's happening inside of you, how you're actually creating these images, having these judgments, talking to yourself in a certain way, and having emotions, and then switching to this and switching to that. It becomes ridiculous after a while, honestly. But it's a good exercise to distance yourself from the emotion and look at yourself from the outside. And there are many ways how you can build up emotional intelligence, but that's one of the very important aspects here is to understand emotions. And then when you go a level deeper, you will see that your emotions are created by thoughts, whether they are conscious or unconscious. And thoughts could also be images. I mean, at the end of the day, it's not like some people think thoughts are just words, just because when you write in books, but just anything that happens in your mind. And you can remember a scenario. You go in the past, you go in the future, you create scenarios with thoughts, you place your attention in certain areas, and that creates an emotion. So then you understand, okay, but hold on. Where do thoughts actually come from? What are thoughts? How do I create thoughts? Do they just appear out of nowhere? Am I creating them? Is the unconscious part of me creating them? What did I just like, if I just think about something? Oh, let me think about uh, my dad. Okay, why did I just think of that? Why did I didn't think of someone else or something else? Why? It's sometimes random, but you can play with this. So there are also exercises where you can actually start to train your mind to observe what's happening. And there are many different ways to do that. But the main principle is to understand these aspects. So when you go a level under thoughts, because some people have repeating thought patterns that come. And you might know yourself, even there are a phase where you were constantly thinking negative or constantly in fear or constantly anxious or constantly whatever it is. There, there are certain patterns that might repeat. Why? Why does one person think this when they see a situation and another person thinks something else? Why can something happen to you? The same thing happens to someone else, but they don't think the same. They don't react the same or they don't act the same. It can't be because of the situation. It has to be because of something else. So what is it? One level on their thoughts is Beliefs and reality. I put them on the same level because your beliefs shape your reality. There is no distinction between them. And actually, I don't really like the word belief because a belief is something you're not sure of, right? If you don't know, then you believe. But the moment they are in your mind, it's not a belief. We believe that we know because we don't know that we believe. So it's actually a fact for us until we find out, oh, that was a belief. It's a fact. So it's a reality. And that's why it's so tricky sometimes to figure it out because you have to see the unseen in your own mind. You have to be able to, to find the hidden paths and you know the hidden information. It's like your brain is playing Marco Polo with itself. So you're trying to really like hide and seek from your own mind. But there are ways to figure this out where you can actually, even if you are, assuming something just to ask yourself like what am i assuming i ask myself this question constantly i look at something and i'm like ah that's like this that's like that i'm gonna do i'm gonna hold on one what am i overlooking if i'm overlooking something i don't see it but just asking myself that question hmm. hold on what do i really know what do i not know one second what am i assuming hmm 
I'm assuming that this and this, and I'm basing my entire reality on this assumption. So it's important to understand beliefs about your industry, about life, about men, about women, about you, about age, about well, beliefs about everything. And they shape our reality. So there are a lot of tools that we can have to actually uh, create, um, it's almost like a mirror. Like every time we flip something, it gives an, uh, us an opportunity to look at it from a different perspective. That's why I love duality exercises where you would take, you can take any statement and um, turn it on its head and you'll find that it's true as well. Because every time that we judge something, we judge it from a perspective, from a specific context. But we change the context, we change the reality. It works with everything. If I say, I'm really smart, or I'm really dumb, or I'm really strong, or I'm really weak, I'm rich, I'm poor. These are all judgments. And all of them are true. Even I, I, I even tried, I said, you know what? There are certain things for me. For example, I said, I'm tall. I'm 6'4", so I'm tall. But if I hang around with NBA players, I have friends of mine, they all play basketball. And, you know, like we were in Paris for a tournament. I was the shortest. I was looking around. I was like, well, yeah, in that context, I'm not tall. Here in Thailand, I'm tall. <laughs> but but the same thing is like, I'm weak, I'm strong, I'm rich, I'm poor, I'm this, I'm that. It's like all of the, I'm young, I'm old. All of these are judgments, but they shape our reality. So if you think, I am this, therefore that, this will influence what you think, this will influence what you feel, and this will influence what you're able to do or not do or what goals you can reach. And then under that, we have identity. And identity is nothing else but the beliefs that you have about yourself. What do you think about yourself? And is it true? What can you or can't you do? Who are you and who are you not? And when did you decide that? And how do you know? And are you sure? <laughs> because that's the foundation of all the rest. Some people, we might call them delusional. Because there's nothing in their external reality that proves that they can do something. But they just believe that they can do anything. You know? It might look crazy until you go through the whole thing and then, oh, oh, okay. Now, I see it so I can believe it. Well, but manifestation works the other way around. You have first to believe it and then you can see it. Manifestation starts from the inside out. But that's why it's so important to understand, okay, identity. Hmm. When we go in, I want to uh, I, I want to talk about this principle, being, doing, having. Being is the foundation for everything that you do and then for everything that you have. And they have to also be in unison because you, you have to understand like, okay, who am I? The more you understand who you are, the more so you're going to understand which goals you are in alignment with your values and who you are and what you want to do and what you want to be because you can have internal resistance towards a goal that you want to achieve because it's not authentic to you. And authenticity is very important. To me, the definition of authenticity is what you say what you do, what you think, and what you feel is one. As soon as there's a disconnect and disharmony in there, you have to understand why. Because if you feel something and you do something else, you're betraying yourself. If you think something and you say something else, or if you say something and you feel something else, I mean, you know, you can combine it any way you want. <laughs> but you want to have it in unison. And once you go in there, I'm like, I, I looked at, you know, the whole aspect of goals, actions, emotion, thoughts, beliefs, reality, identity. And I try to break it down into having, doing, being. All right. So goal is having, action is doing. And to me, being 
is everything that comes under it. Emotions, thoughts, beliefs, reality, identity, that is being. But then I looked at it a little longer. And I said, hold on. Actually, doing includes being. Because you can't be without doing. I understand that we separate them theoretically. But how can you be generous without doing anything generous? How can you be strong without doing something that is set to say strengths? What do you base your thoughts, beliefs, reality, and identity? All these thoughts about yourself, what do you base them on? It is all connected. It is all one. But it starts at the bottom. So a lot of people think, once I have this, then I can feel confident. Then I can feel successful once I've achieved this. But I don't feel like I'm good enough. So I can't even take action. So I can't really achieve. So it's not about fake it till you make it and just thinking and believing in your mind. And you think is you're going to attract it somehow into your life without having to do anything. Doing is being. And that's why I actually included my old podcast, which is just do it and just be. It's actually the same thing. <laughs> but when you look at this now, is any time that I want to achieve a specific goal, I look at this identity transformer. Because I'm like, okay, I want to achieve something. Let's say I want to be successful in this business. I want to make this amount of money. I want to have a six pack. I want to have a successful relationship. I want to be more charismatic and know how to speak on stage, whatever it is. Okay. I have to know what to do. I need information. Okay. That's important. Knowing, doing, but then what is the identity that I need to have? What are the beliefs? What is the reality I want to see? What are the thoughts and the emotions that are in alignment with someone that has that goal? What is the environment? An environment, again, is people, places, structures, routines. And I try to design an environment that is in line with this. And again, a lot of people might be like, oh, I don't know what identity someone needs to have that already has this reality. And that's where role models come into play. Because if you do not know how someone that has what you want to have, does what you want to do, or is how you want to be, thinks, feels, looks at the world and believes, then you need to find out. You know, like children are really good at this. They look at a hero, that Superman, bam, bam, I want to dress like him. I want to talk like him. I want to walk like him. I'm just going to imitate him until I am Superman. No one can convince me I'm not Superman with this blanket wrapped around my neck. I am. I put some, you know, like uh, underwear on top of my jeans. I'm Superman. And they don't have no limitation to be able to believe that. And now, you know, a lot of people, actually, one of the main resistances is people tell me like, yeah, but is it not inauthentic? Is it not fake to, to act as if I'm someone else? And I often ask them, so do you believe that this version of you that you have now is authentic? It's an important question. If you feel something and you can't do it, are you really authentic? You know, I used to be an introvert. Super shy. I was afraid to talk to people. I was always afraid of what people might think of me and this and that, perfectionism. So I know intimately the voices in the mind of someone that is in a space and thinks, oh, I would like to say hi to this person. I would say, oh, oh like a networking event. And you freeze because you're so afraid and so overwhelmed by doing the right thing and being perfect. And what am I going to say this and that before you figured out what you're going to say next? The moment is past. And the people you wanted to say something to, they already walked on. You're like, ah, ah, let me just order some drink at the bar. Yeah. But I know exactly what happens in these moments, but you have a voice, you have an energy that wants to go out, but there's something in you that suppresses it. How can that be authentic? You have learned to suppress that voice. And that's how 
also we create our identity. Yes, there is the environment. There are the role models in our culture, our parents, our teachers, our friends, and all that, that we copy. We have, I said earlier, a symphony of selves within us. So, you know, let's say your sense of humor. How did you know to make jokes the way you joke? They're going to be influenced by your favorite uncle or the, you know, your favorite stand-up comedian or the culture that you grew up in. You didn't come up with this by yourself. You have an identity that you copied for humor. When you're angry, I remember I used to watch, you know, like cool guys in movies and they were like, you know, next, if someone tells me this, I'm going to tell them, hey, one more time and I'm going to knock you out, whatever. You practice this in front of the mirror. You know, you're like, I'm this tough guy or whatever, you know, how am I, you know, like in a business meeting or when I go on a date or what's that romantic version of me? Who do I want to be? We have all these segments and categories that we created. That we got from others. How can that be authentic? And then we have other aspects because another thing how identity is created is through number one, repetition. So something that you think over and over again, that you do over and over again, that you see over and over again, is going to be conditioning you. Then, very strong emotions. So either trauma. There is uh, one uh, psycho psychiatrist, I think he's a psych psychiatrist or psychologist, I'm not sure, Gabor Mate. He works a lot with people who are dealing with addiction and trauma. And he said he said that identity is a trauma response that you had situations in your life that were so traumatic that they shaped who you are because of this i will never do this because of this i'm going to show everyone whether it's your negative aspects or even your positive aspects even your ego that you felt i need to protect myself this is why i need to be the strongest or the i see that so many times you can see someone who is like in the gym on steroids, like a monster with tattoos all over his body, bald and looks like a warrior, but inside is actually a child that wanted protection and created the monster that's going to protect him from the world outside. And even that person can sometimes not even see it anymore because they disconnected from it, but it's like strong emotions. So either very positive reinforcement, you did something, you got a lot of praise and a lot, oh, wow, I like that. This is who I'm going to be from now on. I'm going to make everyone laugh. I'm going to be the clown. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. Or trauma. It was so painful. I'm not going in there anymore. I don't want to feel that anymore. So now I created a strategy to avoid this. And I repeated it so many times it became a pattern. And it's maybe happened so long ago that I don't even remember creating it. Who here remembers learning their first language? You don't remember, but you speak it. That's not a proof that you could always speak. You know that. So how about these other things that we don't remember learning? And it's important to really challenge that. Symbols also so strong. We create symbols constantly. What else is, I'm a man, I'm a woman. That's my age. I have that amount of money. I'm black, I'm white, I'm Jewish. I'm, a, a, you know, like Catholic. I'm a Muslim. I'm this, I'm that. A lot of symbolism everywhere. So it's important to understand what, is, what are the symbols that I have in my life? How do they control me? Did I choose this or was it implanted? Does it serve me or does it hinder my progress? Does it make me happy or does it actually limit my happiness? Can I reprogram these symbols? Money is a strong symbol for so many people that have a lot of very strong emotional reactions to that. Asking for a lot of money or giving a lot of money. A very emotional thing for many people. And no matter how intelligent you are, and that's why it's so important, it's like these hidden aspects of you. It's like being in a car and your six-year-old version is actually at the wheel and you're sitting in the back seat. Hoping like, oh my God, let's, let's hope this is, we're going to get home. You know, <laughs> that's how life feels sometimes. 
And to really reclaim these parts of ourselves is the biggest process in identity creation. Because before you can create or recreate something or work with something, you have to understand what it is. And that's why I focus on this. And, you know, like another thing that I just wanted to quickly talk on is doing and being. Like I said, it's one. So you cannot separate doing and being. And I looked at this word affirmations. And I flipped into affirmations. So that you don't just say something over and over, looking in the mirror or repeat it like an affirmation, but you actually connect it with an action. Because now you're actually proving yourself. You are in unison. As you do something, you're actually speaking it. And looking from your future perspective. So for example, you know, I always say this, uh, someone who's already achieved your goal, or someone who wants to achieve your goal. If you just look at what they do, a lot of times it's the same. Let's just say someone who has a six pack and someone who is 50 kilo overweight. You're overweight and you want to lose weight. So you have to watch your diet and you have to go to the gym. The person who already has a six pack still is watching his diet and going to the gym. You're doing the same thing. You're just looking at a different reality. You don't have the same result in front of you. But if you go into the gym as that version of you that is already successful, you're not going into the gym to lose weight. You're just going to the gym and you're eating this food as the person who already is there. You're going to the office and you're working on your business and you're already successful and you're doing all these things, but not from a place of lack, but from a place of abundance. So it's like the energetic state that you have as you're speaking your reality that you want to manifest is connected with an action, but to be really careful about the judgment that you have of that situation. Because I constantly see people, you, you have a, re a reality right now that is a result of the past. So what you see right now is not the present. You are seeing the past. You look on your bank account, you might have 100K minus. That's the past. Now you start to work on something and you even look at the bank account, Man, I'm so demotivated, man. I'm working, but man, I still have this minus. Honor. You're looking at the past. So am I actually approaching my day from a perspective of my future or from a perspective of my past? Because the present honestly doesn't really exist in terms of manifested reality. You're looking at the past or you're seeing the future right now. And that's something that you can decide to. But when I talk about affirmations, it's important to see that some people, they think they have to start doing something. But you're already using affirmations, even when you're conditioning limiting beliefs. And that's why it's important to pay attention to those. Because when you say, for example, a non-action or an invisible action is also an action. What I mean with that is what I said earlier. You know, some people think that, oh, you know what? I'm an introvert and I want to speak to people. And I, if I take action, I did something. If I don't, well, I didn't take any action. You didn't act. You, you did take action because you held yourself back from doing what your intuition was telling you to do. You suppressed. That's an action. Even if it's not visible externally, it is a movement that is internal. So every time you say, for example, you know what? I'm, I'm not really good at this. You know what? I'll never really lose weight. And you order a pizza or you know what? It's useless to actually, you know, why am I even training? And you don't go to the gym or you know what? I'm an introvert. I'm not really good at these situations. Or, I can never remember names of people or, you know how these things we constantly hypnotize us. We say something and then we condition that reality by not taking action. Every time we speak something we don't want is also an affirm action, just a negative one. And all of this happens in the invisible. And that's why it's so important to start tracking this. So the most important thing I'm going to repeat it is to really start to analyze ourselves, to track in forms of any kind of journaling that you do. Some people do video journals or write down or whatever, but write down your thoughts, but have some form of practice where you can actually challenge your thoughts, flip your thoughts. There's a Katie Colby, for example, or Brian, um, what is it? What, what's her name? Um, Byron Katie, for example, she does a lot of these uh, turnarounds, for example. Uh, but there are many techniques that you can use where you can actually flip your thoughts 
um, reevaluate your emotions, understand your beliefs, and really, at the end of the day, understand how your identity was created, to really understand your own history and how on that history you created many symbols, many labels, and you created many beliefs and how to rewrite that story. And that's actually, actually something that I also learned in filmmaking because, you know, in filmmaking, you have, you have something it's called like the, the backstory. And uh, as a writer, when, when, when you're a filmmaker and you write a script for a movie or, or for a book, you actually write the backstory of a character. And that backstory is never going to be in the movie. It's never going to be published in the book. It's just for you as the writer or as the film director. And in the beginning, when I heard that, I was like, man, this is a waste of time because we got like assignments in school and university. I was like, it's a waste of time. I'm going to sit here for hours creating something that no one is going to see. But I need to know the backstory of that character. If he grew up with a father, without a father, if it was whatever, like all the life circumstances, because that's going to give me an idea of how this character will behave. Your whole backstory and the way you think, the way you're programmed is going to determine how you will behave and you can actually predict the future. So it's important to understand your own backstory, to be aware of it as you're rewriting the script of your life. But that's kind of, uh, the. I see we're on the hour here almost. So uh, if we still got some time, JP, I wanted to share like a small poem because it's like, you know what I mean? But uh, <laughs> nice, cool. Because I, I write poetry and rap usually in German, but I have a few things in uh, in English. And uh, I don't know if JP knows this one. I think you don't know it. So it's like, that would be a good one. Hold on. Let me see. Let me just turn this down. Okay. It's called Do It Now. So it goes like this. I'm going to do it without a beat, just like a, like a poem. Do it now. Do it now. The past is gone. Stop the dwelling. Keep moving now. Do it now. Do it now. Your future is created today, so do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Compliment. Apologize. Express your love. Do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Live your dream. Build your vision. Do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Yes, you allowed. Stop waiting for permission and approval from the crowd. Show the world what you're about. Remove the doubt from your mind. Take the first step. Move the ground under your boots. Stop with the blues. Everybody fell and got hurt. It's not an excuse. You create in your brain all that rain and that pain, but you're breaking the chain when you start making a change. You're bruised in your face, but choose to pursue the race. Your future awaits. Refuse to reduce the pace. Don't stop when you fail, because you fail when you stop. Prevail when you flop and aim for the top. When you're late for a job, when you're afraid or you're stuck, take a deep breath and read what it says on that clock. Now, the future is created from second to second. Now is a gift, and that's why we're calling it the present. Be a shaker, be a mover. Anxiety only exists when you see your failure in the future. It's a waste of creativity. You're visually creating your own misery with mental imagery of negativity. It kills your productivity and limits your ability when you ignore the upsides and focus on deficiencies. I felt so vulnerable and threatened because I was focusing so much on my pain that I was forgetting my blessings. No matter how far I came, I always felt like a loser, dwelling on my past, stressed about my future. I stopped suppressing and repressing, started expressing. I stopped the dwelling and regretting, started progressing. You're depressed and you're stressing because your present ain't pleasant. Life's a lesson. Keep on stepping. Keep on sweating. Your future is created from second to second. Now is a gift. And that's why we're calling it the present. Yeah, man. <laughs> I know. 